God is in control. I love that song. It doesn't, it doesn't deny the reality of our situation. You know, uh, stuff just happens in life, but that doesn't mean God is not still in control. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have been with us the past few weeks, we have been discussing the good, the bad, and the ugly, and talking about resolving conflict. And as we were praying, uh, and we were in the altar, I was struck by, oh, the children's church, there we go. As we were praying in the altar, I was struck by the fact that, you know, we come up and, and we uh, pray for physical healing and, and uh, how God commands that. There are more, there's more than just physical healing. Amen. Amen. There are broken relationships. There are there are people who um, have stress and pain in their life. And so there is more than just physical healing. And, and over the past few weeks, one of the things we have been trying to deal with is relational healing. Being able to see relationships that are stressed and broken, restored. And hopefully uh, that is your desire. Hopefully as a Christian, you have that desire to make sure that you are living at peace with all men and women. Now, here's where we are. And I'm going to just do a quick review, but this is where we are. We've been talking about resolving conflict in a biblical way. Now, we all have our ideas about how conflict can be resolved, right? Uh, Tom mentioned some of those, or Pastor Tom mentioned some of those last week. And he basically went over the fact that a lot of times we get into conflict and our, our desire, our aim is to win that conflict or we may simply try to avoid conflict. In other words, we run away from it. We don't want anything to do with it. And that is kind of... Excuse me, that is kind of a, a form of, uh, of preservation, if you will. And um, we tried, and, and you may say, in over the past couple of weeks, there's some of you who have sat here, and maybe today you'll sit here, and you will say to me, or to Pastor Tom, you just don't know my situation. Or you don't know what I have to deal with. Or you don't know what they've done to me. Or you just don't, you don't understand how much I've been hurt. And you know what? You're probably right. I don't. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can put an asterisk in the Bible beside God's commands and then go say, well, that doesn't really apply to me. All right? And that's what we would like to do, isn't it? Amen. When God gives a command and He says, okay, here's how you resolve conflict. This is the way we as Christian people are supposed to deal with these kinds of issues. What we want to do is we want to say, well, that really doesn't apply to my situation. And I just want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, no matter what kind of conflict or frustration that you have been experiencing, and maybe I'm sure there are some of you in the past few weeks, there are people who have popped up in your mind and you have responded in one of two ways. You don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through. Or maybe you just tried to avoid or ignore it, right? And I want to tell you, do not ignore what we're trying to tell you here over the past few weeks. We worship a God who has gone out of His way to reconcile us. In other words, there is tension in the relationship. There is a Really, it's a broken relationship between man and God. And it is one that is broken on our side. We are the ones that did it. But God, in His mercy and in His love, has decided to go out of His way to restore and reconcile that relationship. God has no, no uh, reason to do this other than He loves us, right? No other reason. In other words, there's not some cosmic law out there that says, well, because there's a broken relationship between us and God, then God has to do something for us. No other reason for Him to reconcile us to Himself other than the fact that He loves us. And conflict for us then is an opportunity for us to reflect what God has done for us, isn't it? So when there is tension between me and my brother, then it is up to me as the Christian to go out of my way to resolve that tension. To make a, a, a resolution here. To make, uh, make sure that we are reconciled. And so 
One of the things I talked about the first Sunday is we must make every effort to get along with people. And last week, Pastor Tom raised several good questions, which we were going to dig into over the past couple, over the next couple of weeks. And, and basically things that we need to ask ourselves as we are involved in conflict. But let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Now, I've had a difficult time this week trying to put all of this together. And so last night, I had thought I was ready on Thursday. Last night, I sat down and just rewrote everything. So. Here we go. Let me read. Verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is my favorite verse in the Bible. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to ask Brooks if she will pray for the message. <coughs> Amen. All right. As most of you probably know, uh, I taught middle school for nine years, and I've mentioned this before, and probably will mention it several times uh, throughout. You know, the next uh, few, next several, uh, or next any kind of sermons that I preach, just because I have so many awesome experiences from that. And and I love middle school, but one of the things I liked about middle school is from day to day, you never knew what you were going to get. All right, you, you never knew what was going to come up, what kind of things were going to happen. And so I would have these, these conversations with kids, and, and I would generally, you know, a lot of times there was conflict, if you can imagine, between middle schoolers. There was conflict between one person and another, and I'd have somebody come up to me, and, and I've made all these names up, so if you happen to be some of these people or know anybody's name is, I made these names up. But I'd have somebody come to me, for example, and they would say, we'll better shut his mouth or I'm going to bust his face, right? Now, my first response when I was a first-year teacher, a second-year teacher, was this. Look at my face. And they'll be like, what? I would say, does it feel like I care? You know what I mean? This is, this is a big deal. You know, this is a big deal to them. You know, they were so you know, distraught about it. And, and I learned that maybe I should try to identify with them a little bit over the years and maybe try to, try to uh, sympathize with their plight a little bit. And so my response soon became... Um, well, what, why do you want to punch him in the face? You know, what is the deal? Well, he's talking about me, or he said this, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And then you would have maybe some girl come up and say, well, Susie's been talking about me. And then the lady who's been talking about her, let's say, I don't know, some other lady named Brooks or whatever, comes <laughs> up and she says, and she's going to immediately defend herself. And she's going to say, well, the only reason that I was talking about her was that, and fill in the blank, right? And then you would have maybe somebody come up and say, well, she won't talk to me anymore or whatever. I'm not going to ever talk to her again. And, and everybody in every of these situations, they felt justified in their retaliation. In other words, they have come up to me and there is somebody that has done something to them and they feel completely justified in their retaliation. I'm not going to talk to her no more. I'm going to bust somebody in the face or whatever the case may be. 
And, or I've talked about somebody, but there's a reason I've done that. And they feel completely justified. And it doesn't change the fact that they've still done something wrong. Because here's the old saying, right? Two wrongs what? Don't make it right. Okay. And I've heard it I don't know how many times, and y'all have too. But it is so true. In other words, we feel justified when somebody sins against us. What we want to do is we feel justified to sin back against them, right? right. In other words, we've got every right to defend ourselves, so to speak. And so what I want to get into this morning is I want you to understand this, is that when it comes to conflict, we can all channel our inner middle schooler, can't we? Mm -hmm. Can't we justify the feelings, the things we've said, the things we do when somebody has sinned against us? Let's get back to 2 Corinthians chapter 14. And let's just go through these verses very quickly. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. In other words, controls us. What Paul is setting forth here is he is setting forth the idea that we are no longer controlled by our own passions and our own emo emotions. We're no longer controlled by this idea that I must retaliate, I must take vengeance. But we're controlled and compelled by some far higher power and that is the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now this is a difficult thing for us to grasp. And I'll tell you why. Because there is something deep inside of us that doesn't want to love people who have sinned against us, is it? Yeah. It could be a family member, it could be a co-worker, it could be someone in your church. And there is something deep inside of us that says, no, they don't deserve my love. Right? Now... What did I tell you as I opened up the message this morning is the fact that God does not, did not have some sort of cosmic law that said I must reconcile people to myself. We are the ones who have sinned against Him, yet it is God in His love and in His mercy, compelled only by His love for us, that has come and reconciled us. And that is why Paul opens with this statement and says, it is the love of Christ that controls or compels us. So that everything that I do from here on out, I am controlled and compelled not by my feelings or my emotions or my perverted sense of justice, but I am controlled and compelled by what? The love of Jesus Christ. Which he says, love your enemies as yourself. Right? He says, if you're angry with your brother, you have committed murder. He goes on in verse 16. And he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. And, and I'm not sure exactly what that means or what commentators would say, but here's how I read it, okay? We regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, he's saying we look at people through new eyes. I want you to understand this. Conflict can somehow has this has this innate tendency to cause us to look at ourselves, how we've been wronged, how people have hurt our feelings, and, and how that we should be, uh, we should have a sense, uh, we should be justified in everything that we do in retaliation or in response. And so conflict has a, a tendency to kind of cause us to look at ourselves, and we look at other people with the most... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We look at our other, other people with the most intense anger, sometimes with the most intense emotions, without thinking about these people are people like I am. I don't know about you, but not one of you are going to raise your hand in here. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you will. And, and say, hey, I'm, I'm perfect. I've nailed life. I, I don't have any other place to go, right? I've never gotten angry or frustrated. I've never done said or anything I shouldn't have against somebody. No one would do that. And what he is saying is what we do is we don't look at people through like, like the people of the world does. What we do is we look at people through the lens of grace and mercy. Every one of us would say, I would like people to be gracious to me and merciful to me because I say and do things I probably should not do, right? And he's saying we don't regard people according to the flesh. In other words, we're not judging people just based on what they say and do. Because if we did that, then no one would live up to our standard. Even we wouldn't, but we would kind of excuse ourselves. Wouldn't we? And he goes on in the next uh, few verses, if you look at verse 18 or verse 17, he says, we are a new creation. 
We don't respond as the world does. We're not the same people we used to be. If we are, and, and listen, there is nowhere this is more evident than in conflict. There's no way that this is more evident in conflict to see if someone is truly converted or see if they're truly trying to follow the way of Christ. Let somebody sin against you and see how you respond. <laughs> see, this is the thing. What is it happening with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was led as a lamb to slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. In other words, Christ was the one sinned against. He was the one hurt. He was the one marred. And the Bible says He allowed Him to lead Him to the cross and never opened His mouth to defend Himself. Think about that. The first thing we do when someone has something against us is what? We defend ourselves, don't we? We justify our actions. We excuse our, our emotions. We we'll say, well, I have every right to feel that way. They said this. They did this. And the Bible says that Christ did what? We're a new creation. And it says in verses 18 and 19 that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we've been given a message to proclaim. And that message is this. That Christ has come into flesh to reconcile us to God. He has died in our place for our sins that we may be seen as holy and righteous in the sight of an almighty God. And since He has done that, the best way for us to proclaim that is not to tell that message and then live like everybody else, is it? Alright? Hear me now. The best way to proclaim that message is not to tell people how much you love Jesus and what church you come to and then be a butthole to people, is it? Amen. Amen. All right? That is not the best way to proclaim that message. In fact, if you are that way to people, please don't tell them you come here. Right? Now, the reason I say this is because the message, every message is filtered through a messenger. And so if we have a ministry, the Bible says, of reconciliation, of proclaiming that God has come in Christ in the flesh, died for our sins, and reconciled us to God through His life and through His death. He died on the cross for us to make us new people, to cleanse us, right? So because we have that ministry, it gives more power to our testimony when we are going out of our way to reconcile people. We are going out of our way to get along with everybody, making every effort to live at peace with people as much as it depends on us. When we go out of our way to overlook sin, to be gracious, to be merciful, and to be able to absorb insults, that gives power to your message, doesn't it? That is what Christ has called us to be. And to proclaim your message about how you're a Christian has no power unless there is something behind it, unless there is a lifestyle of seeking reconciliation with others. You can't tell me that your relationship with God is where it should be when there is somebody always in the back of your mind that you're holding a grudge against or there's a root of bitterness because of what somebody said or did and you are unwilling and feel justified in doing so in making it right. What does Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 5 verse 7? There's this phrase that goes there. He says, look, when you know that your brother as an issue with you. And when you come to the altar to worship, he says, don't leave your gift. He says, leave your gift at the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. That is what God has called us to do and called us to be. We cannot continue to proclaim Christ and still hold grudges and have in the back of our mind those things. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying you're going to get this and nail this perfectly every time. But again, as much as it depends on you, make every effort to make it right. And you say, well, they're the ones with the problem. I hadn't done anything. Well, we'll address it. We'll address it. See, we think conflict is about us. It's about us trying to save face, as Pastor Tom mentioned last week. It's about us trying to win an argument, right? Or it's about us trying to avoid it. 
And listen to this. This is the big, this is the big point for today. Conflict, conflict is not about you <coughs> unless you make it about you. That's right. All right? Wow. Conflict is not about you. Again, we want to make it about us because we feel justified in our harsh feelings. We feel justified in our response, our retaliation. Just like this you know, young you know, middle schooler coming up to me and saying, I'm going to bust somebody in their face. He feels completely justified because of what's been said about him. But yeah, God still calls that sin. And you say, well, it's just, I'm just doing it in response to what they did. And he's still saying, it's still sin. It isn't like God is saying, you know what? I completely sympathize. And you know, if it was me, in fact, I might would punch him in the face too. In fact, God has actually shown us what He would do, hasn't He? By sending His own Son in the flesh to absorb our sin, to forgive us, to overlook our sin, recover our sin, cleanse us from sin, even though He didn't have to do it. Amen? Amen? But again, conflict is not about you unless you make it about you. And I'm asking you to move beyond yourself in the midst of this conflict. Pretend to focus on how we've been wrong, what they did to me, and my feelings. This conflict, every conflict that comes into your life is an opportunity. I want you to see this. It's an opportunity to show the glory of God. It's an opportunity to say, all right, here is how good and how gracious and how merciful my God is. I know you hurt me. I didn't deserve the things that you said. I don't know, maybe you did. I have no idea. But you may feel like you didn't deserve the things that you said. I am just going to overlook this. I'm going to move beyond this. Right? Conflict is always an opportunity. The shift, you can either shift the focus to you, or you can turn it to God and say, okay, God, how do you want to use this to glorify yourself? <laughs> the best way, always, in conflict, if there is an issue between myself and my wife, an issue between a co-worker or a family member, the best way is to absorb it. To just look over it. But again, we all can channel our middle schooler, can't we? And it's so hard somebody has said or done something that's so hurtful. So difficult. And you say, well, I just, I don't know if I can do that. And what happens, and the, and the Bible talks about the root of bitterness, is, is if these things continue in our life, maybe with a family member or, or somebody that's close to us at work or whatever, somebody, maybe a friend or maybe even somebody here in your church, and that root of bitterness goes and begins to grow up, we've got to deal with that or it will consume you. And you will become a bitter person and a poor reflection of what Christ has called us to be. Amen? Amen. And so the best way to always deal with it is to absorb it and to go to God in prayer and say, God, I hurt, I'm frustrated. That's one of the things I like about that last song. It says, I'm a beautiful mess. You know, I go to God, I'm hurt, I'm frustrated. I, I don't, I know the feelings that I have are not right. I know that I shouldn't retaliate, but I want to retaliate. You go to God and you say, God, I have got to overlook this. I've got to absorb it. I've got to move beyond this. And this takes a tremendous amount of prayer. Amen. But we're not willing sometimes to spend the time that is necessary to be able to do that. Now, rarely, now I taught middle school for nine years. I've been in ministry for almost 20 years. I couldn't believe that. All right. Y'all look at me. What? All right. Almost 20 years. I pastored for six years. I was a youth pastor for three years. And I have rarely seen a conflict between two individuals. I want you to hear me now. Rarely seen a conflict between two individuals where it was 100% the other person's fault. Y'all like, mm. <laughs> know that's in my <laughs> But I would be almost never, I don't even know that I've been in a situation. Now there are those exceptions where there may be some abuse or something like that, but, but most of the time, 99% of the time, conflict involves two people. In case you didn't know that. And that's why Paul tells us, as much as it depends on us, if possible, live at peace with all people. And we can always justify and say, the reason I said, the reason I did, the reason I had those feelings is because they and just fill in the blank. We must first 
own our part of the conflict or confess our sin in the conflict. So if you want to do what Paul said, and I want you to hear me, if you want to do what Paul said, make every effort to live at peace, or as much as it depends on you, to live at peace with people, you've got to first own your part of the conflict. And this is so hard to do. Oh, it's hard to do when you've been sinned against. When you feel justified in those feelings and you feel justified in your reaction, it is so hard to do to own my part and to say, you know what? I need you to forgive me. You say, well, the only reason I did that, the only reason I said that, and God still says what? That is still sin. Now, we'll talk about how we do this, but in situations like with a husband and wife, let me give you an example. Yesterday, <laughs> Brooks left the house, and she says, because we decorated for a party, she, she says, do not leave the garage door up, because you know, the wind will blow through and blow stuff out. And I pulled, I, you know, and I was like, I will not leave. And she told me three times, I won't leave the garage door up. Jeez. All right, I'm not going to leave it up. And I said, she said, try. I said, no, Brooks, there's no try. There's just do. You know, go. Just do. I will leave the garage door down. I will not leave it up. All right. <laughs> so I go in the house. And I go back outside, I do a couple of things, and of course I'm walking in and out of the garage door. So I go in the house for a few minutes, and I got the garage door up, and those two minutes that I'm in the house, Brooks pulls up. And she says, comes in the house, I told you not to leave the garage door up. And I said, oh, I was about to walk right outside. Inside, I'm thinking, he pulled up the two minutes that I was in the house. And I was kind of angry with her a little bit on the inside. Because she had come off as, I can't believe you did this. Because I, I'm going to be honest, I'm a man. I go to the grocery store, I don't bring back what she has. I, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, Y'all know what I'm talking about. So I don't, I don't do some of the things I should do. And I really wanted to get this one right. I was trying hard. And so when she came back and said, you left the garage door, I was thinking, oh, I was trying so hard. And I had some hard feelings against her because I was like, you didn't even see how hard I've been trying to do this. But I didn't say, like I should have, you know, oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I said, no, I was about to walk right back outside. I defended myself, right? I justified and I might have been going to walk outside. I mean, the dogs did have to go walk, so I might be going to walk right back outside. Yeah. But you see how we can go there, right? And see this, and, and see, I've got, I've got a little bit of. Now, again, it's not a great amount of anger. It's just more frustration with myself and the situation because I wanted to do it right. But you, you see how that could escalate, and all of a sudden, here I am, thinking, "Oh, I'm so frustrated because I want to get this right." And now she's caught me, and you know. What happens there is that I need to own my part here. What is my part? My part. Well, I left the door open. That's one. All right. And I just need to say, I will, you know, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. But also, I've got anger because she caught me. Right? I tried so hard. I had kept it down the whole time she was gone. And so I needed to get rid of that too. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not, and that's the thing, we've got to be able to recognize our part of the conflict here and know that we hold some responsibility. And listen to me, it may only be that you are responsible for 10% of this conflict. In that situation, it's only 10% my fault. Right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, it's, you, but you've got to own listen to me you've got to own your 10% alright 
Matthew chapter 7, 3 through 5, uh, tells us a lot here. Three through five, Matthew chapter seven, three through five. Jesus says this. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, if I could think of, I'm not going to grab any of the instruments, but if I could think, you know, of a guy that's just got, and Jesus is making a funny here, but he's got a big log sticking out of his eye. And he's thinking, let me get up here close and examine the speck in your eye. How silly and absurd is that, right? And he is saying, you cannot see clearly. And we can't. When we're overwhelmed by anger and, and frustration and all sorts of emotions because of conflict, we cannot see clearly to correct anybody else because if we're not careful, what they've done is so much bigger than what we've done, isn't it? And so here we are with this big log in our eye trying to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. And Jesus says, before you do that, you get the log out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly to be able to bring correction to somebody else. So if there's a situation where there's conflict between me and somebody else, and I truly and honestly, hear me now, I truly and honestly can sin against. I still own some of that conflict. Still there, I still, and you say, well, no, 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 it's just a response to what they did. I wouldn't have felt that way if they hadn't said that, if they hadn't done that. But you still have some responsibility. And here's the most difficult part of what I'm going to tell you today. The most difficult part of what I'm going to say is when you go to confront that individual, the first thing we want to do is to justify ourselves and say, listen, I've come to apologize. I've had some harsh feelings against you, and I've come to apologize, and the only reason I said did that is because you. That is not. We did into this. What he is saying is, you own your part of the conflict. Now, here, here's the hard part. Whether the other party does or doesn't. That's right. Amen. How many times, as a husband or wife, you've apologized to your spouse? Thinking in the back of your mind. I'm going to go, I'm going to be nice, I'm going to apologize, and then she's going to say, you know what, I'm sorry for that. Anybody ever done that? Or just no. <laughs> and inevitably, they do not respond in time. <laughs> All right. Or like we think they should. Own your part, whether the other party does or doesn't. You're cleaning your slate. You can't clean your slate, right? You can't do that. And so, Ken Sandy, in this book that basically a lot of this is written out of, he gives us three A's to confession. He says this, if when we go to confess our sin to someone else, we someone's wronged us, but we have some part of the conflict, and it may be only a minuscule 2% of the conflict is your part. You need to own your part. He is saying this. One, you address everyone involved. And I would say it again with God, because all sin is ultimately against who? God. What did David say? Against you, and you only have I seen. So we address everyone involved in your specifics. So if there is, maybe, you know, if you are a, a father and you were grumpy and everybody in the family felt your grumpiness, right? You need to say, look, I'm sorry, and you address everybody involved. You don't just give this general apology. The other one is avoid if, but, or maybe. I call this the Athlete's apology. Anybody ever seen an athlete on TV apologize for something they got caught doing? Here's how it goes. I just want to say, it's usually read from the script, if anyone was offended by what I did, I'm truly sorry. And I want to say in my mind, no, you're not. Because what if he's done? He's just blamed you. 
Because what did he say? If anyone was offended. In other words, what I did was perfectly fine, but you might have been offended. And that's your fault. That's what he said. So when we go to apologize with somebody and we want to own our part of the conflict, we avoid if, but, or maybe. And we can always put a but in there. I, say, I, I know I said and did this, but you just negated your apology. You've not owned your conflict. Or maybe you should have, right? We always go to confront people and rather than just own our part, we really go to confront people to let them know how they hurt us. Again, conflict is only about you if you make it about you. Admit specifically. It is easy to give a general apology. I'm sorry. You know, if I hurt you, I'm sorry at what, or I'm sorry, but. <laughs> and then we give a general, you know, and I, I, I know I said some things I shouldn't have said. But admit specifically. What does that mean? <coughs> I said. I felt these things and I shouldn't have. I need you to forgive me. And again, we want to go with the hope of, you know what? This is the other part he says. Well, you know what? I, I shouldn't have said no. I shouldn't have said this either. I should have. They probably won't. Own your part, whether the other party does or doesn't. Number four, acknowledge the hurt. Now, there are times in my marriage where I know I have hurt Brooks, and I've got a list of reasons of why she should not be hurt. Right? I've said or done something or didn't do something that has hurt her. And I can give a list of reasons. And say, Brooks, there's no reason you should be hurt. I, you know, I did this. I didn't mean that. And I said, and I've got a list of logical, well thought out reasons of why she should not be hurt. It doesn't change the fact. Now she feels worse because she <coughs> feels like I let she let me down again. Because no, you're right. I shouldn't be hurt. Now I'm hurt because I was hurt. You know. Is that right? You know what I'm saying? You acknowledge the hurt. You're not like me when I first started teaching school and said, it look like I care? I, I don't care. <laughs> you, know? you want to acknowledge the pain. You want to acknowledge the hurt. And maybe they don't know that you had harsh feelings. Maybe they don't know that you said things behind their back. Maybe they don't know that and you've admitted it specifically and you know just need to say, listen, I know you didn't realize this and I know it hurt you and I am sorry. Honestly and sincerely. Accept the consequences. Here's a hard one. Sometimes that doesn't mean everybody just makes up, you know, like at the end of a sitcom back in the 80s. Everybody just made up by, you know, at the end of 30 minutes. Sometimes it don't work like that, does it? Sometimes there may be months or years between complete reconciliation. Sometimes there might not be ever be complete reconciliation. And so we accept the consequences. And we don't try to force issues. Here's the other one, and this is the one that is most difficult. Alter your behavior. This is you showing God and the other party you're serious about changing. Amen. You say, well, you know, I just believe in grace, and, and I just think that, you know, God is doing a work in me. You know, you've got to change some things you do. When we first got saved, you had to alter your behavior. Rather than sleep in on Sunday morning, you started coming to church, right? You altered your behavior. And so I need to alter my behavior. And when Brooke says, pick up this, this, and this at the grocery store, I need to give what she said, right? And some of you have some of those issues that are much more serious. We change our behavior. And lastly, we ask for forgiveness. And this is difficult because that person may not say, I forgive you. Right? <coughs> what do you do about it? But as much as it depends on you, you're trying to live at peace with all people. Amen? Amen. Conflict is about God being glorified and about me examining myself, not to justify my feelings, but to see where I own the part of my conflict. 
So that's all now. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. We're going to do something a little different. Some of you right now, there is some sort of conflict that you may be involved in. It may be big, it may be small, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're a co-worker, maybe you're a family member. I'm not sure what it is. But as you got your eyes closed, I just want you to think about, just for a moment, that individual. Maybe you've been hurt. Somebody has said something that was completely false, unfair, wrong. They just didn't know. Somebody has done something to you that has caused you pain. I'm going to ask you just for a moment to stop looking at your own pain and frustration. And to see them as a child of God who makes some mistakes. And the best way to overcome this is to let it go. Overlook, absorb it. Just as Christ absorbed our sins on the cross, we overlook it. Listen, the only way you have the power to do that is through the Holy Spirit. The other thing, and there may be some of you in here, as you're thinking about that individual, there's a little bit of room of bitterness. <clears throat> There's some harsh feelings every time you see that person or every time you hear their voice. You know, that, that smart comment pops right up in your head. The root of bitterness. You've got anger maybe in your heart. Or maybe you've said or done some things in retaliation for what they've done. Let me tell you something. I'm asking you, please make it. It's not enough sometimes just to go and say, God, please forgive me of what I've said about this individual. Sometimes we have to take the big step of what? Actually going to that individual and saying, I'm sorry, and owning my part, whether they respond in kind or not. And so as we pray, I want you to pray about making an honest confession to that individual if you hold that root of bitterness. Or pray about, God, help me to overlook this sin. Help me to, to, to just absorb it, to let it go. I've been given so much grace Lord. Let me give it to others. So as I pray, you want you to think about those things. And think about through these seven A's how do you address this situation. And who knows, maybe through the Holy Spirit, that would engage them and see that the love that they would see the love of Christ in them. Maybe bring them to repentance. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for everyone who is here. God, I just give you praise, Lord, for the Spirit of God who has been so evident in this place to heal. But not just to heal physically, but to heal emotionally, relationally, spiritually. God, as we, in our minds, we, we, we have some issues, maybe with another person. God, I pray through the Holy Spirit we would have the ability to let it go. Whatever's been said, whatever's been done, we would have the ability to absorb it. To give grace and mercy and the benefit of the doubt. And God, I just pray, Lord, for those in this sanctuary this morning that may have that little room of bitterness. And they just can't get over what was said and done. And maybe they said and done something in response. Or maybe they had harsh feelings in response to what was said and done to them. And God, I just pray, God, that you would help us, every one of us, including myself. That we could approach that individual sincerely and own our part of the conflict. That we could confess. We could admit our sin. We could acknowledge the hurt. We could address the sin specifically. I felt this. I said this. I shouldn't have done that. We could avoid if, but, or maybe, God, and, and put no conditions on our apology. So that we could, as much as it depends on us, live at peace with all people and thus reflect how God has reconciled us to Himself.
And that would give power to the proclamation of the gospel in our lives. And people would see that our relationship with God is real based on our attempt to reconcile. Lord, all those faces that are in the minds of people in this congregation, I pray they see the gospel in action in our lives. Holy Spirit, don't let us get away from confession and reconciliation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before y'all get going, I got a card I want to read to you. This is from um, Miss Kay, as most of you know. Um, Prentice uh, went on to be with the Lord last week. It says, words can never express how blessed my family feels to be a part of this church. We deeply appreciate every phone call, text, food, and visit your PC sickness and death. Even though we can't understand why, when we pray for God's he God for healing, God sees that healing is taking our loved one to heaven. Praise God, PC is no longer in pain and enjoying, rejoicing with our Heavenly Father. May God richly bless each of you for your kindness. Love, Kay and family. One other thing before you get going. <coughs> Pastor Tom and I are going to do an interesting <coughs> sermon uh, where we answer your questions. So over the next few weeks, there will be a box in the back. If you've got questions, Put them in, uh, in the box in the back if you want to Facebook them, whatever. We'll try to pick them out. And uh, he's going to sit up here and answer some. I'm going to sit up here and answer some. And uh, so we're going to be doing that in a few weeks, sometime probably in May. So I want you to keep that in mind. And uh, But there will be a box out there labeled starting next week. So keep that in mind, all right? All right. Love y'all. God bless. See you next week.